This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 43. In this episode, I will tell the stories of attempts to walk across America and the entire world backwards. <gasps> yes, backwards, wearing glasses with side mirrors. Wow. To celebrate this backwards story, maybe I should tell it backwards. Huh? Here is my name backwards. Give me it. Why don't you try it? Give me a cheer backwards. That's it. This will work great. Now clap backwards. Episode 43. Here theater of the It's the theater. What's wrong with it? The seats face the stage. <laughs> and now, friends. <laughs> Commercial time. What's happening to you these days? Having lots of fun? Believe me, I know some folks that are in for some fun. Those early bird friends of Annie's who've already sent for their new 1940 model Orphan Annie shake-up mug. You know, all of Annie's friends who drink sweet chocolate-flavored Ovaltine can get these swell new shake-up mugs free. And boy, are they beauties. Wait till you see them. We now return to your regular programming. Now to the story of the backwards walks. Walking backwards, retracing my steps. Walking backwards, back to before you left. I'm going back past where it went wrong, back to your arms where I belong. Hey, look at me, walking backwards. Attempts to walk backwards for ultra distances have taken place for more than two centuries. Why? One backwards walker said, With the whole world going backwards, maybe the only way to see it is to turn around. Obviously, such attempts cause a stir of attention. Common comments heard around these individuals were, What is that fool doing? And, When did he get out of the asylum? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way! Oh, he's drunk! How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? In recent years, some have actually encouraged the practice as a way to burn more calories, sharpen senses, train your peripheral vision, and improve balance. Try it out. Gives you amazing confidence. It's a great sense of accomplishment. Five minutes backwards is the same as 20 forward. This is fun. It's low impact. You won't be injured. It burns the calories straight away. Gives your tummy a workout. Your back gets a break. It's great for people with bad balance. It's great for your coordination. Your confidence, your peripheral vision, your balance. But walking backwards for hundreds and thousands of miles is simply bizarre. Let's first take a look at the very early history of walking backwards for ultra distances and then examine the stories of attempts to walk backwards across America and around the world. <laughs> In 1817, at Wormwood Scrubs, England, Darby Stevens started to walk backwards for 500 miles in 20 days on a wager of 50 guineas. A line is laid along the ground, which is 200 yards in length, and which he takes hold of when he deems necessary. It is unknown if he was successful. But the next day, Daniel Crisp of Paddington, England, took his place at the same location without the aid of a rope and walked 280 miles backwards in only seven days. A newspaper editorialized, We have reason to believe that the idle scene of walking backwards, which continues to disgrace even wormwood scrubs, is encouraged toward the very worst purposes, and the public disgust will be still more excited when we state that it is meant to continue this vicious scenes throughout the whole manner of the summer. Another of these reprehensible matches is already determined upon. <laughs> In 1823, John Townsend walked 73 miles backward in 24 hours at Bristol, England, on a one-mile out and back. He commenced at midnight. A man preceded him with a lantern during the night. 
Also that year, Townsend walked backwards 64 miles per day for 10 successive days at Ipwich, England. On August 5, 1915, Patrick Harmon of Seattle, Washington, age 50, started walking backwards from San Francisco bound for New York City on an alleged $20,000 wager between two parties. He needed to arrive in 260 days in order to win. He left with his friend William Baltazar, who was to act as his guide walking forwards and watching for obstructions in the road and supposedly making sure he covered every inch walking backward. Harmon began his backwards trip from the Panama Pacific Exposition Grounds at San Francisco. Backing carefully along his road and walking his path behind him only by means of a small automobile mirror fastened to a rod and a bracket on his chest, he seized his stick and knapsack and started out. The two planned to average 15 miles a day and raise money by selling postcards and selling subscriptions to a magazine. On day four, Harmon was witnessed about 40 miles to the east walking backward in Livermore Valley. The first appearance of the walker in the distance was decidedly curious to the spectators. He carries a mirror attached by a spring in an ingenious way to his coat, which guides him somewhat in his freak undertaking. Word of Harmon's stunt spread in the newspapers across America. The latest freak stunt is to cross country on foot walking backwards with his seat to the windward. On only day 57, they arrived more than 1,000 miles to the west in Salt Lake City, Utah. That would be averaging more than 22 miles per walking day, climbing more than 35,000 feet along the way, likely into snow, and nearly all very rough dirt road on the Lincoln Highway with small towns very spread out. The only detail he shared along that way was battling a rabid coyote at Woosley, Nevada. There is a huge problem with that story. He claimed to walk the Lincoln Highway across Nevada, but the town of Woosley wasn't on the Lincoln Highway. It was on the railway line about 80 miles north of the Lincoln Highway. It is highly likely that they took trains through this most difficult and slow stretch of the West. After four months, in December 1915, Harmon arrived in Kearney, Nebraska after traveling more than 1,700 miles. He said he was averaging 18 miles per day, which does match closely with the miles between towns and newspapers and a realistic pace. He said his best was a 26-mile day in Colorado. Harmon is well educated, and while admitting that his test of endurance is a freakish one, he rather enjoys the novelty of it. On February 13, 1916, Harmon arrived in Chicago, Illinois. A motion picture company produced a film showing him arriving to the city. He started to call himself the champion backward walker of the world. Near Pittsburgh in April, it was said, They attracted a lot of attention as they hiked in over the Lincoln Highway, one of them walking backwards. Both walkers were clad in drab-colored walking suits with leggings, and each one carried a canteen. They sold quite a lot of postcards while in a neighboring town. On May 22, 1916, a New York City newspaper reported, Patrick Harmon of Seattle paraded up the steps of City Hall today, walking backward, guiding himself by means of a reflector. Harmon explained that he traveled 3,900 miles in 239 days. His total days were 291. His watchman, Baltazar, said, Harmon walked backward every inch of the distance. After his walk, Harmon went back to Seattle to live and work for the railroad. There was no news from Seattle if he won any prize. Did Harmon really walk backward across the country every step? This is unlikely. He, like most of the transcontinental walkers of the time, discovered the impossibility of walking through the rugged west of the Sierra, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming without significant help. His pace was too fast to be believable, and he detoured to the railroad route. It is believed he took rides. But in the populated areas of the Midwest and eastern United States, his pace was consistent and believable. 
His story published in local newspapers did not change, and there were witnesses that saw him out on the road. He was likely true to his quest through those states. But it is very unlikely that there was a wager involved. No valid wager would employ a close friend of the walker to confirm it. His walk did cause very intense news coverage across America and likely did get the attention of future champion backward walkers. Jackson Corwin was from Missouri who became known as the Human Crawfish. On September 17, 1923, he started a transcontinental backward walk of 5,000 miles from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to San Francisco, California. Corwin said he undertook the trip partly by accident. He overheard two acquaintances discussing the feasibility of a transcontinental hike one night. When one man estimated that he could walk the distance in six months, Corwin explained, why, I could walk it backward in six months. He was to be accompanied by a man who would be the official timekeeper and watchman to gather proof of his feet. He said he was sponsored by several athletic organizations who would award him a prize if he was successful. He was to walk the entire route backwards and stick to public highways whenever possible, but he had his choice of routes. He needed to finish in 500 walking days, averaging 10 miles per day. The public was urged to report violations. Corwin said, the object of this trip is to further the cause of amateur athletics and to gather useful and interesting information for the articles of which I am author. He boasted that he knew more people in America than any other person. In reality, Corwin wasn't well known and his hometown newspaper had to remind people who he was. Witnesses did see Corwin walking. One man reported, when about 20 miles from the District of Columbia boundary line, I met up with a man walking backward. I accosted him and learned that his name was Jackson H. Corwin. To save his neck from tiring by twisting and to guide himself, he was continually using a hand mirror, and I wondered to myself, what next? One newspaper commented, If the key of some asylum might be turned on him, it might be the best thing that could happen to him. Bristol, Tennessee reported, He is attired in hiking togs consisting of an army uniform. He carries a pack on his back carrying traveling necessities which weighs about 40 pounds. In walking backwards, he uses a small hand mirror held in front of his shoulder and sees where he is going by looking in the mirror. Corwin said he stopped for nights mostly with farmers along the road and only three would accept money for his lodging. Common comments were, What is that fool doing? And, When did he get out of the asylum? Corwin was hit by a truck in Knoxville, Tennessee, but not seriously injured. He talked about the difficulties of walking backwards. It is more of a mental strain than a physical strain. I am especially interested in watching the reactions of the people we pass on the road. About half of them think we are crazy. Of the other half, some think we are doing some advertising stunt. In Oklahoma, Corwin's walk made a significant turn to the north for some reason, and he stopped for a significant time. He only walked 14 days in the next 137 days. No explanation was given. After one year on the road, in September 1924, Corwin arrived in Neosho, Missouri. He now towed a burrow as he walked that carried his things, including camping gear. He was a blatant self-promoter. My present tour is probably the most famous tour ever undertaken on this continent. My picture and accounts of my undertaking has appeared in more leading magazines and periodicals and in almost every daily newspaper in America. I have behind me hundreds of thousands of people who will never forget me. Seldom do I arrive in a village or city without a crowd waiting to welcome me. I am entertained in mansions and cabins. Many people are proud to have me as a visitor. He was quiet as sight on the road. I must stand the gaze of the curious, the jeers and jibes of the ill-mannered, the suspicions of many that I am crazy. 
still heading north instead of west, in November near Kansas City, Missouri. He said he had walked 2,052 miles in 201 walking days in a total of 386 days, but he soon quit his walk. What appeared to happen is that Corwin was likely doing a legitimate walk until around Neosho, Missouri after a year's time. He then knew he wouldn't finish and headed toward his home near Kansas City. Once arriving at Kansas City, Missouri near his home, he quit for good. Believe it or not. The 1930 Ripley's Believe It or Not erroneously included Corwin in its series, stating that he walked all the way across the country backward. Perhaps that inspired the next backwards walker. Lenny Lawrence Wingo was from Abilene, Texas. As the Great Depression hit in 1930, he struggled to earn a living. He lost his cafe and was working as a clothing salesman trying to support his wife and 15-year-old daughter. That year, he conceived of the idea to become an entertainer by learning how to walk backwards at a fast pace and believed that nobody had ever walked around the world backwards. Perhaps he got the idea from those who came backwards earlier, but it appears that he thought that he had invented the concept of distance walking backwards. He said that for about six months he practiced in secret at night for 15 to 20 minutes so others wouldn't steal his idea to walk backwards around the world. As he went public with his plan to walk backward around the world, he claimed to be the first reverse walker of the world. My friends kidded me about it, and that made me all the more determined to carry out my plan. It was reported, Wingo is beginning a world tour. He says he will walk backward around the world. He climbs stairs, dodges pedestrians or automobiles, and otherwise walks backwards and apparently about as good as the average person does normally. His only aid is eyeglasses, which he wears, and which have tiny mirrors on the side of each eye. Like others before him, his scheme involves selling postcards along the way. Wingo started from Fort Worth, Texas on April 15, 1931, bound for New York City. Many people wanted to handle his walking cane and took a look at his unique glasses, and he quickly realized that all his contact with curious people greatly slowed him down. By his second week, a story and picture of him had spread to most of the newspapers in America. The same thing can be said of him that is said of a mythical species of backward flying birds. He doesn't care where he is going, he only wants to see where he has been. After six weeks, Wingo backed his way into St. Louis, Missouri. Many motorists driving the highway toward the city stopped to talk with him. I hadn't heard of anybody backing around the world, so I just thought I'd try it. It's great for health. I average three miles an hour, but stop whenever I feel like it. It seems almost as natural as walking forward. When I get through with the trip, I expect the habit will be pretty well formed. I haven't any important engagement until I see my wife and baby again three years from now. Apparently Della, his wife, was not totally on board with Wingo's walk, and her letters were increasingly critical because she had the burden at home to survive the depression. Wingo averaged about 20 miles in walking days. After he crossed over the Mississippi River at Eads Bridge, a policeman stopped him and asked him what he was doing and told him he was not allowed to walk backwards in the city because he might get hurt. Wingo was forced to walk forward to the police station and there got permission from the police chief to walk backwards. He then returned to his point of interruption and continued on looking back at the angry policeman who couldn't stop him. At Edwardsville, Illinois, Wingo put two new toe plates on his shoes. He had already worn out 16 pair of metal plates. He used specifically built shoes with heavy soles and low heels and would wear out the toes first. Since Wingo wasn't walking with a partner, he would send his luggage ahead by bus from stop to stop and carried only his cane with a steer horn handle. Walking through Chicago, he was such a curiosity that crowds gathered around him and started to block traffic. A special policeman was assigned to do crowd control as he walked. I pretend that I never notice anybody. I walk steadily and rather fast, seemingly to concentrate on my own business. 
When I enter a city, I sort of put on an air of mystery, and do the people fall for it? First thing you know, I've got a job of some sort, usually carrying a sign while I walk backward around the town. On one occasion, he caused an automobile accident. A motorist encountered him on a highway and turned in his seat to stare back at a man walking alone and backward. Another motorist approaching was also interested in Wingo. The two cars hit bang on, but nobody was hurt. Near Canton, Ohio, after covering about 1,700 miles, Wingo stepped into a hole on the road and fractured an ankle and was taken to the hospital. From his hospital bed, he vowed to continue his trek once he was healed. After four weeks of healing, Wingo was back on the road. He was witnessed refusing rides from motorists. In Pennsylvania, while walking out of a city, a policeman pulled him over to issue him a ticket. Wingo asked what the offense was. Mopery in the second degree. The policeman warned him that he would need a lawyer and issued him a citation. Wingo finally looked at it and it read, Good luck on your trip around the world. They both had a good laugh. <laughs> at Pittsburgh, he was given a traffic ticket for walking on the right side of the street, even though he was satisfying the law by facing the cars. After 50 days of not receiving a letter from his wife, she finally wrote again and told him to quit his walk and come home. She was tired of surviving alone. His daughter also wrote, telling him that his wife was in poor health. He had not been sending money home. It was the saddest and heartbreakingest letter I had ever read in my life. He felt that both his wife and daughter had turned against him and wanted out. Wingo did not return home. He continued on. In mid-October 1931, Wingo arrived in New York City. It was a major milestone for his walk, but he still didn't have a major sponsor nor a way to get to England. He considered quitting and decided to move into a boarding house and get a temporary job in a cafeteria. He also earned money doing publicity stunts set by a manager, including walking backward along an 18-inch ledge of a 12-story building. His manager ended up swindling him out of the money, and they got into a fight over it. In December, he decided to continue walking and went to Connecticut and on to Boston, Massachusetts. He received a letter from his wife, Della, informing him that she was through with the marriage. She had asked him to come home, he did not, and she was done with him. He signed the divorce papers. Wingo arrived in Boston on December 23, 1931. He jogged hippity hop at the height of traffic last night, a strange and curious sight for eyes which usually see the world from the accustomed pedestrian's angle. He had now walked about 2,500 miles and was determined to find a boat to England. He was asked why. Well, it's an ambition I've had for many years. There's no competition in it either. Besides, it's a lot of fun. I'm outdoors too and have a great chance to see the country, even if I do have to look at it backward. The head of a shoe company found Wingo passage on a ship to Germany by hiring on with the crew. He steamed to Hamburg, Germany on the Seattle Spirit. He boarded the ship, walking down the gangplank backwards. The work on the ship and travel was terrible, and he suffered from seasickness for the first five days. At Hamburg, the steward would not allow him to get off the ship and held back his passport. He had no choice but to continue to work on the dock ship. After a couple more weeks, he left the ship while the steward was away. Wingo started his backward walk in Hamburg, Germany, as curious Germans wondered what the sign in English said on his back. Soon a man helped him with a new sign in German. Along the way, he was treated kindly by the country folk who invited him to stay in their homes after he showed them a news story that had been published in the Hamburg newspaper. He said that his daily average miles were fewer than in America because he could not rely on getting rooms at inns. He had to develop friendships along the way, and that took time. 
Snow hindered Wingo as he continued 100 miles to the south to Dresden and through the German forest beyond, living off the kindness of others. In May 1932, he entered Bulgaria and later was arrested at Sofia and taken to jail. The American consulate arranged to free him after five hours. He next headed towards Istanbul, Turkey. At the Turkish border, he was locked up for several days, but rescued by a kind English-speaking man, and he was allowed to go on. I met two policemen, border policemen, and they didn't know what to do with me, because I walked back and they arrested me and took me right into jail. But as he arrived in Istanbul, police officers surrounded him and took him to jail, and then he was taken to the courtroom many times. After days in jail, he met up with the assistant to the American ambassador who promised to help. The newspapers got word that Wingo was stuck in jail in Turkey. Plenty Wingo is stranded in Turkey and can't get out backwards or forwards. Now he's in jail without a visa and broke. The American consul was not interested in helping Wingo, thinking his stunt was ridiculous and stupid. He was being charged for not having enough money to get through Turkey and being a nuisance to the public because of his backwards walking. He gave assurances to the embassy that if they would get him released, that he would exit back out of Turkey. He was eventually released and stopped his backward walking. He took a steamer to Marseille, France, and worked his way on the ship Exeter to New York City, where he arrived on June 15, 1932. Did that fantastic adventure really take place in Eastern Europe? There are problems with it. Yes, there is no doubt that he was there. But the primary source of the events was a book that Wingle later published. In the book, for some reason, he didn't understand how far he walked from Hamburg to Istanbul. He thought it was only 900 miles, but it was actually about 1,000 miles further. His timeline and distance did not work well. He missed many walking days being held in jail and never walked every day in a week. At most, he had about 60 walking days. His pace on walking days in Europe would have had to be 32 miles per day, an impossibility compared to what he had achieved earlier in America. Wingo most likely embellished his European story decades later for his book and did not walk backwards all the way. He did end up in jail in Turkey, but his story there did not coincide with reports filed by the State Department. Like most of the other globetrotters, he started off his effort with integrity, but after his family broke apart and with money pressures, he eventually walked backwards into embellishment. On Wingo's return to America in July 1932, he drove with a friend to California. He wanted to finish a transcontinental trip by walking from California to Fort Worth, Texas. He falsely bumped up his claimed mileage by about 2,000 miles and said he would reach 7,000 miles by reaching his home in Texas. In Phoenix, Wingo was arrested by police who said it was against the law to walk backwards within the city and taken to jail. He was told that he would be put in a cell with a murderer. When he asked to make a phone call, he was taken downstairs where he met an old friend laughing. It was all a gag. In only one month from San Diego, California, Wingo arrived in El Paso, Texas, doing a totally impossible blazing hot 900 mile walk. He claimed that he carried a pillow, blanket, and thermos. He would have needed to carry more than a gallon of fluid with him. He averaged an impossible 35 miles or more per walking day. Wingo had turned from being an embellisher into a pretender. On October 15, 1932, Wingo returned home to Abilene, Texas with a very fast finishing pace. He was greeted by his daughter, Vivian, who still lived with Della, his ex-wife. He said they were on friendly terms. He said about his journey, People ask me what I expect to get out of it. Well, I did something everybody said I couldn't do, or at least demonstrated that it could be done. On October 24, 1932, Wingo finished his walk at Fort Worth, Texas. He hoped that the city would award him something, but they didn't. He said, 
I won't walk backwards for some time. I've had enough of that to last me. In 1946, he married a waitress, Juanita, who was just three years old when he started his walk. She was 18 when he married her, and he was 51. They moved around the country working in the restaurant business. Wingo published his book, Around the World Backwards, in 1966. Few outside his family bought the book. He later changed the total backward mileage to 8,000 miles. It probably was actually closer to 5,000 miles. In 1971, his name was put into the Guinness Records book for being the only man to walk across the U.S. backwards. Not quite the only one, if you consider Patrick Harmon's earlier walk. For America's bicentennial at the age of 81, Wingo, living in Los Angeles, announced that he would walk across the country backward in five months. In 1976, he appeared on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He very soon cut back his plans and in late July 1976 started a walk from Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco to Santa Monica along the Pacific Coast Highway for about 450 miles, sponsored by the Ripley Museums. Wingo took a nasty fall at one point and sprained an ankle so that he had to finish the walk using his cane significantly. He did finish, but decided there just wasn't enough money in the profession and said he would retire. Most people walk through life looking straight ahead. That's most people. But then there's plenty Wingo. He prefers to walk backwards. Mr. Wingo calls himself the world's backward walking champion. Two years ago, he walked 452 miles from San Francisco to Santa Monica. Today, Plenty Wingo tours the country, lecturing school children on how they're better off walking backwards than getting mixed up with drugs and crime. Equipped with his homemade rear view mirrors attached to his glasses, Mr. Wingo has had no serious accidents over all the years and miles he's walked backwards. But you never quite know how people are going to react. Plenty Wingo will soon celebrate his 84th birthday and intends to continue taking his backward strolls. While younger people may enjoy looking forward to the future, at 84, Plenty Wingo prefers looking back on where he's been. In 1989, at the age of 94, Wingo was interviewed in Texas. Wearing a weathered gray felt hat, the perky blue-eyed fellow carefully donned the dulled tortoise-shelled glasses and began fiddling with the mirrors extending from the arms of the ancient spectacles. Thinking back over his accomplishments, he said, I'm in all these museums in wax, and I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records. Plenty Wingo died in 1993 at the age of 98. Yes, walking backwards was an ultra-running thing. Will it ever return? Running backwards is also a thing, and called retro-running. The fastest known backwards marathon is 343, set by Zhu Zhenzhen at Beijing in 2004. The fastest known backwards 100K is 1220, and the best 24 hours is 95.4 miles. Who will get the fastest known backwards 100 miler? With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.